If I was taken from my home as a baby and successfully accepted into a traditional Maasai family, I would grow up to be a completely different individual. For those of you who don't know, the Maasai traditionally are a group of cattle herders living in Africa, and their culture is about as different from mine as it gets. And if I was raised as one of them, I'd be unrecognizable as a human today. I'd spend my days tending to cattle instead of editing audio. I wouldn't be an atheist. I'd worship Engai. Instead of tattoos and earrings, I'd have stretched out earlobes and body paint. And I'd be living on a diet consisting of milk, honey, meat, and cow blood. The least vegan diet it is possible to contrive. So... I'd have completely different looks, beliefs, and behaviors, and there wouldn't be much of the Mackin you know left. And for the point I'm about to make, the specifics here aren't really important. There's nothing special about the Maasai or me. What I want you to notice here is that you could take any human baby and put them in any human culture, and as long as the members of that culture didn't reject them outright that baby would likely grow up to be a remarkably normal member of that culture, which is to say, a completely different person than they would have been. As a human living in the human world, it's very easy to miss how remarkable this is. There are a few weird things here. First, across our range, our species varies more dramatically than any other in its behavioral repertoire. The difference in lifestyle between a member of the Maasai and a New Englander like me, is far more dramatic than, say, the difference between a gray wolf in Russia and one in Canada. And second, where the regional differences we see in other species that vary across a large range are often genetically influenced, the regional differences in our species are hardly genetic at all. The only really meaningful problem my genetics would cause me among the Maasai is that I'd be sunburnt all the time. Clearly, culture sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom in meaningful ways, and according to the man we'll talk to in this podcast, culture sets us apart in a decisive way, which is to say he believes the reason our species is this planet's dominant life form is because of our ability to use culture. According to this man's book, The Secret of Our Success, Culture allowed us to become the animal kingdom's runaway victor. First, by allowing our species to adapt to a much wider range of environments than one would have otherwise guessed possible, the fact that a hairless, sweaty ape suited for long-distance running could thrive in the Arctic, kayaking and hunting whales, is slightly surprising. And culture didn't just take us around the world, it also pushed us into the future, by allowing us to build on the knowledge of previous generations. Most other species start their lives at sea level. We start on the shoulders of giants. And this progress comes at speeds other species simply can't keep up with. Whereas in genetic evolution, useful adaptations can only spread from parent to offspring, cultural adaptations can at this point, spread throughout almost the entire species in a single generation. To take a very recent example, most humans now use the internet, which barely existed 40 years ago. So his book's basic thesis is that our profound and total adaptation to culture is the most important thing about our species. Now, where things get really intellectually interesting is in looking at how cultures develop. It seems that cultures arise through a selective process, where cultural traits that are useful spread really quickly and stick around, and cultural traits that aren't so useful go extinct, because they struggle to spread. Sound familiar? Yep, it's a lot like genetic evolution. The end result is that we have complex, highly adapted cultures. That is, we have sets of non-genetic behaviors finely tuned to the environment in which they arose. Today, I got to ask the author of The Secret of Our Success a wide variety of questions about cultural evolution. I asked about the evidence for how culture evolves, 
the ways in which the first people to arrive in an environment come to develop culture, the validity of using children as models for uncultured humans, the relevance of quote-unquote raw intelligence to human success, and the extent to which human nature is genetic. In the course of our discussion, we also spent time on why LeBron James is such a good insurance salesman, why most cultures really respect their elders as advisors, but mine does not, and the differences in cognition between ourselves, chimpanzees, and Neanderthals. And at times, we also dipped our toes into the potential philosophical implications of these facts and ideas. Today, I got to speak with Dr. Joe Henrik. Professor Henrik is the chair of the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University, where he has made significant progress investigating cultural evolution, answering questions about why our species is the way it is, and why groups within our species differ from one another. He is a truly interdisciplinary scientist with relevant expertise in anthropology, psychology, and economics. And as if that weren't already enough, he began studying human evolution in earnest after retiring from being an aerospace engineer. So, if this stuff isn't rocket science, that has little meaning for him. Enjoy. Could you explain what exactly culture is for the purposes of this conversation? Of course, yeah. So culture is information stored in people's heads that got there via learning in general and, and mostly via social or what I call cultural learning. So learning from other people by imitation uh, and other ways of kind of reconstructing underlying mental states and goals and strategies. And this is the thing that humans are really good at compared to other species. Right. And one peculiar fact about culture uh, that is all too relevant for this conversation is that cultures fit their environment in the same way that the bodies and instinctive repertoires of animals fit theirs. And in the same way that genetic evolution explains the latter um, fit, you believe that something called cultural evolution explains the former. Yeah, that's right. Cultural evolution is just another information system like genetic evolution. And in The Secret of Our Success, I make the case, and uh, this is along with a, uh, you know, part of a large research program involving lots of other people, that our minds have been shaped by natural selection over long periods of time to make us a cultural species. So to make us particularly good at acquiring ideas, beliefs, and values, and other, other aspects of culture from others. And this allows us to focus on, say, more successful or prestigious people, to key in on ide uh, ideas or techniques that are more efficient, those kinds of things. And then over time, this creates a filtering process, which is akin to the way natural selection filters things. And then it gives rise to complex behavioral products and technologies that no individual could figure out on their own. Could you give some examples of the fit between culture and environment? Because I think most of us, we kind of have this conception of culture as this, oh, it's completely arbitrary and it's something that just happens and the differences between cultures are completely meaningless. But it's actually remarkable how closely our beliefs and behaviors and technologies and traditions are suited to the regional environments in which those arose. So if you have some examples of those that you'd like to share. That would yeah, be so one, one fun one that I talk about in the book is uh, the spicing in foods. Mm. So spicing is a peculiar thing to do because it involves adding non-caloric substances that often are the, the toxins in plants that keep animals away, sometimes even mammals like humans. So chili peppers are meant to keep the mammals from eating them, the, the capsaicin and chili peppers, so that birds will eat them and give them better dispersal. But humans have harnessed these and put them into different recipes. And when you look around the world, we find that the, the hotter the climate, the more people rely on some of the most pungent spices. And it turns out when you take these into the lab, Things like, you know, garlic and chili peppers and regular pepper uh, are antimicrobial. So they'll kill uh, microbes in a Petri dish. And the argument is that these things uh, help the problem of, you know, spoiled meat, essentially, of getting pathogens in your meat. So if you use a lot of spices on it, you end up killing the pathogens. 
And there's interesting chemical concoctions. So things like cilantro actually seem to work most effectively when it's put on uncooked, which is how it's usually used. And it may also have synergetic interactions with other spices. And so this is the scientific reason why white people enjoy such bland food? <laughs> right. The, this natural selection for those, that amount of melanin in your skin tended to place uh, populations with less melanin in their skin at higher latitude. And those latitudes don't tend to require a lot of spices because food stores and it doesn't spoil because it tends to be colder. And so in your book, you completely lay out that, and, and you give many examples of this, where cultures and cultural habits, such as how they prepare their food, how they hunt, um, what they believe about the way the world works, these things are finely tuned to suit the environment in which they arose, right? Exactly. And in your book, you cover a lot of evidence that cultural behaviors fit their environment. But I personally feel like I was missing evidence for how this fit came to be, right? In, in biological evolution, there's robust evidence for the processes of natural selection, as well as the fit itself. And right. I, I felt like with cultural evolution, I definitely saw the fit, um, but I didn't necessarily understand um, or see the evidence for cultural evolution as the means by which that fit came to happen. So two-part question. First, how do cultures come to fit their environment? And second, what evidence do we have for that process? Yeah. So uh, the theory that I mentioned earlier is that uh, people, our minds have evolved to give us selective attention. And that includes selective attention into what I call context and also content. So context is things like who you're paying attention to. So I'll talk, I can talk about evidence in a few minutes that people and even young children and even babies will preferentially attend to more skillful, successful, and competent individuals over time. There's uh, evidence to show that people tend to copy people with positive affect or happiness, people who seem to be making their way in the world in a way that makes them happy. Also, healthier people tend to be imitated. Also, people attend to certain domains, so domains like food, social norms, uh, facts about other groups seem to be prioritized and processed in a certain way. So we have uh, a specialized mental circuitry that helps us um, make use of that information. I can give some examples if you want. And the evidence for this comes from simply putting children or babies or adults in simple laboratory situations where they might see one more competent individual or a prestigious individual do something or express a certain of opinion, use a certain technique, and see whether these biases exist in the way people copy. And then to do experiments that are kind of like micro-society labs, where you have a group of people learn something, and then another group of learns from the previous generation, another group learns from the previous generation, to see if you can generate increasingly complex tools and traditions and techniques. And so there's quite a number of experiments showing that process. Interesting. And you give the example in the book of uh, LeBron James being paid millions to endorse Allstate. Um, he's an expert on basketball, obviously, but there's no clear rational reason to trust his word on insurance. So that might be uh, our instinctive desire to copy the successful in our environment going a little bit um, overboard. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's from a body of work called The Evolution of Prestige. And there the idea is, is that a lot of times, you know, if you, if you have good information about who's skillful, you can use that information. This would be like direct information, like if you actually knew what uh, his uh, throw, you know, shooting percentage was or something like that, LeBron James. But in the absence of that, you can just see that lots of other people defer to LeBron, people mm. attend to him, they want to watch him. So this gives you a cue that he's somebody worth paying attention to. And then people pay attention to prestigious individuals across a wide breadth of domains. And the explanation is there is that to be a su successful at something, you often need a lot of different elements. You might copy how the best hunter in the community you know, makes his arrows or something like that. But you also might want to copy that he eats a lot of carrots or gets up early in the morning because mm. all of these things could be contributors to his hunting success. So we seem to have generalized that, which can lead to the, the kind of Le LeBron, James, LeBron James extended copying. Right. Yes. It, it, it's quite humorous to think that um, because of how generalized our copying is, we can end up doing things like, um, I don't know, taking your favorite podcaster's word on uh, <laughs> their mattress recommendations right, um, right. or whatever like that, right. um, even though they, they are only qualified to do a very narrow um, domain of things. Yeah. 
So one thing that I'd like you to talk about, and and this will perhaps make it more compelling to my listeners for really how I mean it's it's hard to exaggerate how um, how impressively important culture is. And one thing that you run through is just the many times where humans have attempted to go into an environment, even a really lush and fertile one, without the cultural knowledge necessary to survive in that environment, and it's just been a complete disaster. So I'd like it if you could impress upon them just how essential um, it is to have the cultural repertoire necessary um, for any environment on earth. Yeah. And so one of the ways I illustrate this is with what I call lost European explorer examples. So these are cases where some group of hapless European explorers uh, find themselves stranded in an environment that seems hostile to them, but for which some group of hunter-gatherers has been successfully living in for hundreds of thousands of years. And, you know, the stories are all pretty similar in the sense that they get marooned somewhere, so say Central Australia or the Arctic. Um, they can't find food. They, can't, they have trouble traveling. They can't treat medicinal problems. They often eat toxic food, sometimes turn to cannibalism. And they only survive the degree to which they're able to prevail upon the locals. Now, meanwhile, the challenge is that they're failing to succeed, not being able to figure out how to catch fish, um, you know, not being able to figure out how to make a shelter to keep warm at night or start fire without technology are things that a local adolescent could, could easily have handled. So one local adolescent uh, carries with them this cultural heritage of the knowledge of the past generations of their society that allows them to easily navigate these environments for which someone with, say, education and lots of skills in other domains, you know, can't do, can't do the first thing, start a fire and, and, you know, kill an animal with it, with a tool they made. Right. And this really, these examples really debunk what I think is an idea that I I don't know if it comes from an evolutionary psychologist, but it's definitely common among them. Um, And it's definitely ended up kind of seeding its way through, it seems, most of the general public that's interested in evolution which is this idea that humans evolved to be intelligent and, in fact, so intelligent that we could just figure everything out wherever we arrived on Earth. Um, and you're taking examples, obviously, of in, really intelligent, capable people who are exploring the world and going to places that are totally suitable for humans to survive in, but they are dying um, horrible deaths uh, because they just don't have the... They don't have the knowledge. And a lot of that knowledge is really complicated. And, and, and you go through many examples where it, 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 there are these intricate um, traditions and habits that um, that really couldn't have been devised all at once and couldn't have been devised by any one individual. And it's not mysterious to me why stranded adults from other cultures can't figure this stuff out, right? Like if you, if you put me... Um, in the wild, basically anywhere on earth, I fully expect that I would die. But clearly someone figured this stuff out. And one thing I struggled with right off the bat in reading your book is how did the first people to arrive in any environment come to master their environment, right? Why why didn't every homo sapien that managed to leave their local African neighborhood die out? Well, I think, uh, I mean, uh, this requires speculation, but the first thing to remember is that any given group may not have moved very far, and so the environments that they're moving into are just a little bit different from the previous ones. So a lot of the knowledge that they have applies to the new environment. It's just that they have to generate some new stuff to take advantage of different uh, kinds of knowledge. So, for example, in the peopling of Australia, you probably had people who inhabited the islands of Southeast Asia. And then they they find themselves on the beach of Australia, which they can use a lot of their knowledge about fishing and and extracting marine resources. And then they can gradually move inland and figure out the all acquire all the knowledge that Burke and Wills didn't have, but that the that other Aboriginal groups in Central Australia would have had. So Mm. if you just think of it as a much more slower process where you have partial information, it's easier to see how it could have happened. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny you say that example because I'd actually written a note to myself to ask about Australia because I could kind of I could visualize it with moving across Eurasia that it's like, oh, well, the the fauna and flora aren't going to be so different. But Australia was kind of the example I had in my head of, oh, they, they would arrive and they'd just be in an alien world. But you're right that if they were island hopping um, all the way there, then maybe um, then maybe they could dip their toes into um, the new land and return to the old and 
Yeah, yeah I mean, there's evidence that ancestral, well, so it's actually anatomically modern humans uh, 40,000 years ago were doing deep water fishing, pelagic fishing in those islands. So even if you're on mainland Australia, you can still take advantage of kind of deep water fishing and all the kind of beach gathering, clams, mussels, all that kind of stuff that, and this is, these are very abundant environments. So the challenge is really when you move away from seas and uh, rivers and lakes and things like that. Hmm. Interesting. You draw an analogy, um, obviously, between cultural evolution and genetic evolution throughout your book. Um, and to summarize that analogy for the listeners who haven't read The Secret of Our Success, um, in genetics, various physical and behavioral traits appear and are selected for based on their fit to their environment. And over generations, you get bodies and behaviors that are quite capable. And in the same way, various cultural traits appear and are selected based on utility. And over generations, you get a cultural suite of traits that is very useful in the environment evolved. Um, in traditional genetics, the variation producing mechanism uh, mutations are random. And I was interested in reading your book if you believed that the variation producing mechanism is random for culture as well. Or does the human mind perhaps tend to produce mechanisms that are more useful than chance would predict? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a great question and something I don't think we have a very uh, good quantitative answer for. I think there's an assumption that, you know, learning always takes us in the right direction, meaning individual learning experience, mental projection, that kind of thing. Uh, and that might be the case for lots of things. But in the book, I try to point out uh, things that, you know, cases in which uh, it would have been really hard to figure the thing out, that no way that you could have inferred something, or sometimes mm. our intuitions take us in the wrong direction. So I, I talk about the, um, there's a complex processing uh, procedure for uh, cassava, which is a primary food crop in lots of the world. And certain kind of cassava requires you to extract the cyanide from it. So there's a long process. And the process really, it's a multi-day process. There's kind of straining and waiting. And, uh, and if all you did was use taste cues, you'd probably end up eating the cassava before it had all the cyanide out of it. And you would eventually, in the long term, get acute cyanide poison. I mean, uh, chronic cyanide poisoning mm -hmm. rather than the acute poisoning. So your taste buds can maybe keep you safe from the acute poisoning but uh, they can't necessarily keep you safe from the long-term poisoning. So what you do is really have to stick to the rules and just go through the whole process. So I think there's lots of things like that, like lots of sports, like learning to ski or something. You often have to do the non-intuitive thing, the thing yeah. that your learning mechanism doesn't take you to, and you have to resist it. And that's why training and that kind of thing can be advantageous because the coach will keep making you do the thing that doesn't, that your body doesn't want to do. It wants to do something else that seems easier. It says, you know, the, the lower road, so to speak. Right. And this was one of the most intellectually interesting parts of the book for me, um, because one thing that I don't understand is why individual people don't abandon these processes. You describe the phenomenon of causal opacity, right, where where people do very complicated cultural behaviors, such as the food processing you just described. Um, and they're doing it. Uh, the reason that their cultural behavior has evolved is to stop something as subtle um, and pernicious as chronic cyanide poisoning. Right. And yet the people doing this processing in, in many cases don't have or similar processing don't have any clue what the actual point of doing it is. <laughs> right. um, and maybe I, I'm wrong, but I feel like um, I, I feel like everything that I spend a lot of my time doing, I could explain to a third party why I'm doing it and my whys would be coherent. And, and furthermore, I feel that before I copy someone else's cultural behavior, uh, like if I'm, if I'm working in a new job um, or, or I'm trying a new sport or an instrument, I'm always asking like, wait, why am I doing it this way? And I, and I want, and I feel that I, I'm not going to necessarily follow through on doing it unless I have an understand, an understanding of the, um, chain of cause and effect for why I'm enacting that behavior. Well, I mean, well, so part of the argument in the book is that, you know, we've been selected to have a faith instinct and sometimes mm. you just copy things. Now, the kind of process you're thinking about would be, I think oftentimes people, especially in our society, will copy some procedure, say a recipe or something. So say you're making a complex cake and you got to do A before B and B before C, or that's just what the recipe says. Now, you might not understand why you got to mix the butter before the eggs and then, you know, put it in the pan and then let it sit. 
Uh, now, over time, you may be able to back figure out the causality of each of those, at least develop sensible theories about why it's better to, to take route A instead of route B in terms of the ordering of the steps. Um, but for really complex things in the world, it can be very expensive. So I use yeah. examples of these hunting poisons that might have 50 steps in them, lots of different parts, complex chemical interactions. It would be really hard. It would take a laboratory to kind of break that down and figure out whether the order matters and what the optimal way to do it is. So the idea is that cultural evolution can sort this out and give people a, a recipe or procedure, and they don't have to understand the internal steps. Now, the degree to which they can come to understand that could help them improve it and stuff, and that's, that's certainly a part of the story, but they don't have to understand it. And one place where this really came home to me, my first job was as an aerospace engineer, and we used to follow these procedures. And as I got to, into the job more, and I ended up doing some test work, and I began to understand that what we thought on the engineering floor as to why the procedures had to be run and how they interconnected were actually wrong. Um, mm. And that the procedure worked, but wasn't working for the way we, the reason we thought it was. Your cooking examples is pretty perfect for me because I'm realizing that I have never done a recipe um, that I found online or in a book or whatever um, and been like questioning every step. Like I really do just do it in the order that it says, as it says it, and don't think twice about it. And it comes out right. And I, I, I don't um, try to rebel. Right. Um, so if it says one teaspoon of salt, do you think, well, should I put a teaspoon and a half? Or a <laughs> yeah. teaspoon and three quarters? Maybe that's <laughs> Right, right, right. I'm not experimenting. Um, but just to push back um, still yeah. a little more, like we definitely do. So there definitely is this kind of submitting to whatever um, whatever you're being told to do. That's very common. And this may just be, I haven't read your second book, um, or I, I don't know if it's your second, but your, your latest book yet. Um, so maybe this is just a weird thing. Um, but I definitely do feel that teenagers, including um, myself when I was a teenager and basically everyone around me, we were completely rebelling against what our parents were telling us to do. Um, we were completely rebelling against our parents' values um, at almost every opportunity. And so I didn't really, I kind of witnessed what seemed to be the instinctive opposite of what you're describing, where we're instinctively having faith in our cultural traditions and values. I, I felt like there were these cultural traditions and values being pressed on us, but there was this instinctive urge to just be like, no, let's do it different. Let, let's, let's feel different ways. Let's believe different things. Yeah. So uh, two thoughts on that. One is that I do, th I mean, in the, in my most recent book, the weirdest people in the world, I do show in fact that culturally variable across societies, um, people that come from societies that are Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, which is this acronym weird, tend to be uh, novelty seeking. They tend to be suspicious of tradition. Uh, they're, they're less likely to venerate the sages compared to other societies where there's a lot more emphasis played on what the ancients said, what the elders say, kind of parental authority, that kind of thing. So that varies across society. The other interesting thing, and this is probably acute for your generation, is that the rate of change of societies affect how useful the paraparental in data in, uh, culture is. So imagine a society that's changing so that the world experienced by the generation growing up is quite a bit different from the world experienced by the parents. That means that the, the parents have less useful stuff to teach the kids. And they'd be more likely to, or more uh, better served by copying successful members of their own generation or people just a little bit older than them, maybe. Yeah. But if you're in a very stable environment where nothing's changed since the grandparents, then you, you know, actually the grandparents have experienced that environment the longest and they're likely to know the most about how to navigate it. So I think that may be something that is adjusted as, as culture evolves. Fascinating. It's it's funny to think that maybe growing up, um, I was witnessing my parents struggle to turn on and off their computer, <laughs> and that uh, little cultural cue was kind of a reverse yeah. LeBron James, where I was saying, okay, they're bad at that, so maybe <laughs> maybe I shouldn't believe what they believe or think what they think. Right, and um, that, and, and that's a turns out to be an important skill where it's pretty central, right? Yeah, yeah, it's um incredibly important. Um, even even this morning, um, so. We do live in a culture that seems to be um, abandoning its traditional values. I mean, you'd obviously be more informed on this, but it, I certainly get the sense that um, whatever 
our culture believed 100 years ago is, is very di different to 50 years ago and very different to today. And I'm, I'm not putting a judgment on this. I mean, I'm, I'm part of this process. I really don't conform to many of the cultural commitments of my ancestors. Um, but I'm interested to know if you as an individual view this as a risk. Right. Are, are people who are socially conservative, and I, and I don't mean that euphemistically, I mean people who are literally interested in conserving their traditional society, are those people accidentally right about something profound here? Yeah. And I've, you know, I've made that point in a couple of different ways. Um, I mean, I definitely think we got to interrogate the old traditions. So I'm, I'm, I'm not for tradition for tradition's sake uh, or any kind of old school conservatism. But I do think one of the tendencies is to assume, so I've made this argument about uh, normative monogamous marriage. So uh, in my new book and, and a little bit in The Secret of Our Success, I discuss the evolution of monogamous marriage, which most societies have been polygynous. And in the book, I make the case that what normative monogamy does is it uh, reduces the size of the pool of excess men. And excess low-status men tend to create a lot of problems. They commit crimes, they need to climb the status hierarchy in order to get into the mating and marriage market. And this will, this large pool of uh, excess males develops when you have high levels of polygyny. So as the elite men have second, third, fourth, fifth wives, you get fewer and fewer wives for the men lower down the scale. They can't have kids, they can't get a stake in the future. And this changes their psychology in key ways. So I was involved in this uh, debate, or really it was a Supreme Court case in British Columbia, where they were thinking about getting, uh, they were questioning whether the laws prohibiting polygyny were constitutional. And so I was just informing the court. I mean, I, I wasn't making the case on either side, but I was just saying one of the costs of having polygyny is that you can generate the social dynamics where you'll lead to this large pool of unmarried men. You know, so... So there may be some functionality to monogamous marriage more than it just being an old you know, Victorian or pick your favorite period custom, old Roman custom uh, that's left over from a, you know, a time now past. It may function in interesting ways and affect social dynamics in ways we care about. So we should at least think about those before we you know, dispense with old institutions, for example. So let me ask a question that... Um that I, I want to be very sensitive with, um, but but it, but it's but it's one that I think is important because I think that your theory might have um, potentially negative social implications, or it could be interpreted in a way that could lead to negative social ramifications. So you make a very convincing case that cultures, like organisms, are in a fight for survival to some extent against each other. As you know, in the early to mid-1900s, misunderstanding of Darwin's ideas led to a very dangerous philosophy we remember as social Darwinism. Uh, essentially, proponents imagined themselves to be in a coherent genetic group that was in a fight for survival against other genetic groups. This view was false on both counts and has largely evaporated with a better understanding of Darwinism. However, from where I'm standing, your ideas and the ideas of others who support the theory of cultural evolution could lead to similar conclusions, but without similar refutations. So I'd like to know, what would you say to someone who, after reading your work, says, oh, cultures are in a fight for survival? Well, I want my culture to win. Let's fight. Right, right. Yeah, so... Uh I kind of, I think that there's material in The Secret of Our Success that addresses that. Um, but if not, or I mean, at least the, the next book, The Weirdest People in the World, really goes into detail on this idea, which is that, uh, part, of that part of that question uh, brings us back to how it is that humans are able to generate cumulative cultural evolution, and specifically innovation. So the idea is that really human innovation, human cumulative cultural evolution is not driven so much by the intelligence of single individuals, this is one of the main themes in the book, but rather by something I call the collective brain. So larger and more integrated populations are uh, better able to generate new ideas. So if you just think about a large population, the more minds you have, if everybody's even just experimenting at random, you're more likely to get useful ideas, those ideas diffuse, 
they recombine with other new ideas, and they generate faster innovation. So there's now lots of evidence, which I review a bit of in The Secret of Our Success and even more in the new book, and just showing the power of the cultural brain. And part of that encourages or leads to the, the uh, favors, uh, things like tolerance and immigration, because all of these things bring new ideas, <clears throat> and anything greater trust amongst individuals leads to more flow. So what we have is the evolution of institutions that are be better at building collective brains, lead to faster innovation, uh, more sharing of ideas, new technologies, and this is driven, so U.S. innovation is fueled by immigration from other places because of how that stimulates the collective brain with the inflow of new ideas. And so there's a nice body of work now in economics showing how immigrants from different places have driven so much of, of innovation. So this is a big difference between genes and culture because people aren't isolated in their groups. They can move to new places, adopt new ideas. So there's a lot more fluid flow there or uh, flow there. The other idea that I develop in the second book is the notion of domesticating intergroup competition. So the key idea is that competition amongst these cultural groups leads to this greater prosociality. But I make the case that by having voluntary associations where people can join, whether these be firms or monasteries or lots of other possible uh, institutions that can compete sports teams, you actually create a selective process that's akin to group selection, cultural group selection, and generate some of the same prosociality uh, and cooperation that you get. So you can kind of domesticate this older, more um, darker and more violent process. Right. So it, it's a complicated balancing act because on, on one side of the scale, obviously, bigger, um, more diverse cultures are going to be smarter, have better technology, make progress faster, um, everything that we want. Um, but we also see that competition between cultures is where we see some of uh, some of our worst behaviors, of course, war, genocide and things like that, but also right. some of our right. best behaviors in terms of loving each other, loving thy neighbor um, being kind to one another, having um, communities that genuinely support each other um, and are there for one another. And so your idea is that we can domesticate, and, and I'm using your words there, domesticate the warfare side of things in competition and replace it with things like the Olympics? Yeah. Uh, th I mean, that's one idea. And I mean, economic, well-regulated <clears throat> economic competition um, you know, competition to reduce global warming levels, all these kinds of things could lead to similar dynamics if you can get them going. Do we see that there's greater prosociality within groups um, when there's domesticated forms of competition that, that are very low stakes? I mean, who can run the fastest? Yeah. So, well, so that's one of the ideas I develop in the new book, which is I, I, there's a couple different lines of evidence. First, if you do it, if you do it in the laboratory, and you just have groups that are playing a cooperation game and you introduce competition amongst the groups, you don't even have to have their payoffs directly being affected by the competition. If you just tell them there's another group out there and you're, they're going to get scores, uh, that tends to increase how much people cooperate. And of course, if you incentivize it, it gets even stronger. But where the data that I think that I lead, you know, I lead off that section in the book is this natural experiment that, can, that happened in the U.S. So you have 50 states and uh, lots of different firms competing in the different states. Beginning in the sort of late 60s and early 70s, states begin deregulating their banking industries. And what, when you deregulate the banking industry, what that did is it freed up capital, which led to the creation of lots of new firms. So, you know, by the measures that economists use to measure the amount of competition amongst firms, you were getting increased competition amongst the firms. Now, in the U.S., we have the, the General Social Science Survey, in which there's a trust question. So we can track the trust of different populations in the U.S. through time using this generalized trust question. So do you tend to trust people around here? And what you can see, because the deregulation hit at different times in different states for idiosyncratic reasons, you can look at the time trend of trust when a state gets deregulated and then see whether it starts going up or down once the competition hits. And what that data quite strongly shows is that when competition was de deregulated, Capital floods into it, firms begin competing, and people begin to trust each other more. 
So the idea is that this, you know, and these are mobile firms, so you need norms of cooperation and trust for people who are moving among different firms and, and ephemeral. So it's not like the people who live in your town or the people of your ethnic group. It's the people you might be working with in a firm or a corporation or something like that. So I thought that was a pretty interesting body of evidence. Interesting. And and so obviously you're you're a scientist, and so your work is largely observational. You're someone who tells us how the world is, and it's not necessarily your role um, to dictate or um, pontificate on, on how it should be. Um, but I'm very interested, because this is, this is so your area, how you, how you would want um, our world to look in terms of the relationships between cultures. Because I've heard kind of, I hear interesting and really appealing visions on on multiple sides of this. Like I, I hear people who, who say that um, a global cultural diversity is fantastic um, and, and it's amazing that we have so many beliefs and we want to preserve these and we want to preserve all cultures um, in perpetuity. Um, and that that sounds appealing to me. And then I also hear people who say, oh, the, the real dream is is that we all meld into one amazing superculture where it, where there's no there's no borders, no countries. We're just planet Earth, human species. Um, and we're, we're, we all believe similar things or, or relatively similar things and practice things similar ways. And that also um, that also appeals to me. So if, if you're comfortable, I'd be interested to see. What would be, in your mind, the best cultural future uh, we could aim for? Well, I mean, I, I don't really have a normative, uh, anything normative to put forward. But I do think that uh, this idea that we're all going to homogenize is just that historically and kind of cultural evolutionary, that's just not going to happen. Because what we see in different places is although there's lots of spread of shared values and, say, say new forms of business organization or similar forms of business organization, these are then interfacing with local ways of doing things. So if you look at Japan, it has a virtual copy of the American legal system, but it, the way its legal institutions work is quite different in the U.S. So I make the case that's because people think about the world differently, and that causes the exact same formal institutions to function rather differently. And then so, I mean, there will be a competition in the sense that some groups will, the particular recombination of things they get as things spread globally, for example, universal schooling, is going to interface with what the cultural traditions and practices in a particular place and to create something new, a new recombination. And then, you know, over the long run, that's going to have output in terms of, you know, how innovative that society is, how cooperative it is, whether it's able to maintain, stay united. Uh, all those kinds of things will play out, and some places will break down, others will stay united longer, eventually everything breaks down. Um, but yeah, so, so that's how I see things playing out based on history and this, these ideas in cultural evolution. Fascinating. Well, well time will tell, and, um, and hopefully, hopefully it all works out. Um, <laughs> so I do also have some, some maybe lighter questions um, to wrap us up here. Um, so I, I'd love to know what your opinion or what your vision for I mean, increasingly, having read your work um, and become more interested in cultural evolution and its processes, I, I, I've had a harder and harder time imagining what an uncultured human would be like and look like and um, behave like. I, and, I, and I struggle to even imagine that kind of creature as a human. But as someone whose expertise is the um, cultural input of things, what would a human be like if you took away the cultural inputs? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting uh, thought experiment and, and actually an experiment we'd never really want to do because the, the consequences would be so devastating to any individual who was in, in such an experiment. Because, I mean, um, the case I make in The Secret of Our Success is that we've been co-evolving with culture for so long that we're really dependent on it, even for like fairly basic aspects of cognition. Not that there's not a human nature that's uh, created by our genes, but many aspects of our cognition don't achieve full development until they get input from culture. So for example, language, uh, you know, you wouldn't have any language. And then that would inhibit all kinds of other thought processes, which harness language in some way or develop some aspect of the brain. Uh, and in the, in the new book, The Weirdest People in the World, I document all this interesting psychological variation which gives you a sense of how much culture can shape how people think, whether they use intentions and moral judgments, um, all the so different social norms, aspects of perception. 
So, you know, I mean, an uncultured human would be like, you know, raising a monkey or something in a cage where it couldn't move in the sense that it wouldn't mm. get to develop in anything like a normal way. And so you wouldn't expect it uh, to be very monkey-like or in this case to be very human-like in a, a human race without culture. You alluded to the fact that you believe that there is a human nature, that there is um, a human nature determined specifically by our genetics or at least strongly influenced by it. And with most of the, I, I wouldn't call you a cultural anthropologist, but with, when speaking to most anthropologists who are interested in culture, they seem to view culture as magically able to make humans however, um, however possible. Um, and really that almost everything that we could conceivably care about is modifiable by culture. And so I, I'd be fascinated to know to what extent you see our genetics and our instincts playing a role in how we behave as animals. Yeah, I mean, there's just uh, such a rich number of ways in which I think our genes influence our ultimate behavior. So something like um, just how we think about artifacts or how we think about plants and animals. There's lots of interesting cultural variations, sort of which animals people believe in, but every, all groups that have been studied seem to do category-based induction. So if I tell you something about one lion, you generalize that to all lions, or at least mm -hmm. you're often willing to generalize it beyond like, so Leo hunts at night. So if Leo hunts at night, what can we say about other lions? You know, so people do that automatically without teaching. Uh, that's one example. Prestige and dominance, so these two kinds of status that I talk about in The Secret of Our Success. I think prestige is a product of cultural evolution in the sense that it gave rise to a particular genetic evolutionary process. But prestige looks pretty similar across different societies. All society seems to have prestige and dominance in various forms. Um, and even the ethology that we have for dominance, for example, is similar to what we see in non-human primates. So it's hard to explain the similarity of a dominance display to a pride display uh, without recognizing that there's continuity with other species. Humans live in families everywhere, and we all have kin bonds with blood relatives. Now, culture does a lot with families, and it extends them. It creates cousin marriage in some places. It creates... Uh, uh, kinship-like relationships that don't involve genetic relatedness. But genetic, you know, mothers are important everywhere would be one way to simplify it. Yeah, and another example of that generalization habit you mentioned is that we seem to believe all lions need to be named Leo. <laughs> so another question I would have about that kind of on the same vein is you dance around this point, certainly at the start of your book, about comparing humans to our closest relatives, um, chimpanzees and bonobos. And because intelligence is so, when most people think about human evolution, intelligence is so preeminent um, and so important. Do you believe that an uncultured human would be smarter or would appear smarter in, uh, by the standard um, definitions of that word? I know intelligence is, is a complicated thing to think about. Um, but do you believe that an uncultured human would strike us as more intelligent than a mildly cultured um, chimpanzee? Just because we don't know, obviously, what right. uncultured chimps or are even, like. I mean, I'd be happy if we say, look, we do the experiment on the chimp and we do it on the human. Neither one of them gets to learn culture. And yeah. then let's drop them into their natural environments and see who survives. Yeah. And call the one who survives better the smarter one. Uh, so there, my money's all on the chimp. All on the chimp. Okay. And what about with more flexible things? Like generally when we're investigating animal cognition, the scientists who do that are taking them into the lab and exposing them to novel problems such as like a weird box contraption that they have to open and mess with. Um, do you think that humans would outperform chimps on that sort of task? Yeah, that's the amazing thing. So the research that's been done on that uh, by Mike Tomasello and his colleagues suggests that there, I mean, there's not a lot of obvious difference. So, so two and a half year old children who we can think of as light, light, more lightly cultured, although they can already speak, um, perform pretty similar to chimpanzees on lots of tasks. The only place where the humans, the two and a half year old humans blow away the apes is in their capacities for cultural learning, for learning from others about how to use a stick or object. And the argument that I make is that a lot of our cognitive abilities are kind of bootstrapped up from the culturally constructed worlds we live in and from social learning. So if you think about something like wheels or pulleys or uh, screws, these are super useful tools, but many of them were invented at some point in human history. So something like a wheel we tend to think of as being, you know, ancient, but the wheel was invented, you know, 6,000 years ago in Eurasia, 
never invented in Australia, only used on in toys in, in the New World. Um, so once you invent a wheel, you can make pottery wheels and you can make carts and you can do all kinds of things. So that's a very simple mechanical device that makes you smarter. It allows you to solve new kinds of problems by thinking about rotisserie motion. Same things with screws and levers and those kinds of things. So culture makes us smarter is the case that I make. And I, and I would agree with that. But in those experiments done by um, Thomas Ello et al., um, one thing that, that I, I was really taken aback by is this is the idea that it's a fair comparison for a two and a half year old child versus a um, versus an adult chimpanzee, mm -hmm. because I mean, I like I, I really don't want to um, disparage my students, but I, I taught seventh grade science um, for a year and it, it was remarkable to me how difficult it is for a 12 year old to understand a new concept that an adult would grasp in the first time you said it. Maybe that is largely culture, but I can't help but think that there's a biological limitation that comes with having a smaller brain, um, mm. just being a, being a younger person, like your brain's not fully developed, um, the, the interneuronal connections aren't fully there, and the, the brain capacity, the size, they're physically, it's physically not as large as it will be. So when I see the comparison of a two-and-a-half-year-old child to a chimpanzee, I'm like, well, yeah, the, the child definitely doesn't have as much culture as an adult human, but they also don't have as much brain as an adult human. And what right. I'm really interested in is the comparison of computing power um, between raw computing power, if that's even if that's even meaningful in this conversation. Right. Um, and I think my listeners will be interested in this as well, is do humans actually have the computing advantage that it is assumed by almost all people that we have? Certainly we have, you know, many more neurons. So in some sense, even that two and a half year old child has many more neurons. But my argument is that, that and many others, uh, is that, that all those extra neurons are provided to be programmed. So it's mm. kind of like raw memory waiting for input. Uh, okay. And it's, you know, we have all these cultural learning mechanisms that we're going to program that up, that kid. So in the book, I, I show myelinization. So that's kind of like the finishing touch you put on brain circuits when they're kind of ready for use. And chimps come into the world much more highly myelinized than humans do. And then they myelinize up pretty quickly. So their brains are getting up to, you know, their capacity, their adult level capacity. Humans are still not completely myelinized as adults, right. especially young adults. So this is all like leaving room for plasticity and learning and, and modification. Um, so I think that's important. Another thing I did when I was writing that section is I got the data from Esther Herman because I wanted to see what the age effect was on the apes. The, the young apes are just as smart as the old apes, or the, I should say, say that the other way. The old apes are just as smart as the young apes. So the apes aren't having a big age trajectory, whereas the humans are having a big change over age. So if you want to tell a maturational story, it's not showing up in the apes. It's the humans that show the maturational story. So whatever, so whatever that difference is, it, it, it seems to fit with the basic picture. I mean, I'm, I'm realizing more and more that as much as we as scientists would enjoy being able to set it up in a way where it's perfectly fair, the differences in myeliniz myelinization rate um, even alone hmm. um, are enough to render any kind of age to age comparison. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's like no longer scientific. Like, yes, you're, com you're comparing animals with similar years under their belt or similar percentages of their lives, but it's, it's not necessarily relevant if, um, if the thing that you're trying to isolate, the brain development, um, is not being controlled for. Yeah. So human brain development has been shifted around in all kinds of interesting ways. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess one last question, and this is still going to be on our brains, um, which I suspect, um, despite our best efforts, many of the listeners are going to come away still kind of believing that, um, that it's all about our raw brain power as individuals and not our um, really, truly incredible ability to accumulate knowledge um, and, and modify our behaviors. Um, but one interesting area that, and again, this has to be speculative uh, just because of the nature of what we're talking about, one interesting area that you play with in your book is the differences between us and the Neanderthals, hmm. where we see that there's this other species of ape in the fossil record that had bigger brains than us on the individual level. And so, I mean, brain size is the best best physical correlation we have for intelligence in primates. They had bigger brains than us, 
and yet we somehow outcompeted them. And so whatever story you're going to tell about why humans survived and the Neanderthals didn't, raw intelligence seems like a really bad or at least a really not justified hypothesis. And so your idea, and, and, and this might be a bit of a complicated question, so your idea is that the real important difference was that humans were better able to leverage culture. But I've read in your other work that you believe that the reason that humans evolved big brains in the first place, um, or really big brains in the first place, is as a result of and to accommodate culture, right? And so I guess what I'd be interested to know is if humans evolved big brains for and because of culture and Neanderthals had bigger brains, how did the Neanderthals get the bigger brains without the cultural springboard, if that is indeed the, what caused the difference in our survival, that we had culture and they had less of it? That's the interesting thing about big brains is there's kind of two reasons why you might have big brains. One is to make you better at acquiring all this large body of cultural knowledge. But also, if you're in an environment that requires a lot of rapid adjustment, then you need a bigger brain for better individual learning. But the individual learners don't tend to have the runaway process. So with Neanderthals, they probably had a degree of runaway process as they expanded into Europe. But then you get Ice Age, they begin, they really adapt to Ice Age Europe, Europe, and you can look at their bodies and how they adapted to it. So there the idea is, is that as their collective brains broke apart, they had to compensate with uh, some amount of individual learning as they adapted locally. So um, uh, that, I mean, that's one potential process that could lead to that difference. The idea I'm more enthusiastic about, though, is just the idea that the African variant of Homo sapiens, so, so uh, Neanderthals are Homo sapiens as well, expand out of Africa, and they already have larger groups. So they have bigger toolkits, and they're able to outcompete the Neanderthals because they have larger collective brains as opposed to individual brains. And this led them to have things like possibly bows and arrows, for example, which you would have had these small groups of isolated Neanderthals that would have had simpler tools because of, their, because of having less of a collective brain. Right. And I guess one final question on that is that in the book and in this conversation, um, you've repeatedly extolled the virtues of larger group size. Why is it that larger that our supergroups that we see now, I mean, we, we see work by Dunbar and others um, showing that human populations are naturally and human brains naturally limit us to relatively small functional populations. And it's only in the last um, in the post-agricultural environment that we see this these these massive groups. So why is it, if, if larger groups are so useful, why is it that they didn't come about in Neanderthals, number one, and only came, ab and really large groups only came about in us very recently? Right. So uh, the, the argument about the Neanderthals is just has to do with the ecology and climate. So you had uh, widely scattered resources uh, and no technology to otherwise deal with the Ice Age environments. Um, in, and then what we see happening as the Holocene approaches, so, so humans start engaging in uh, agriculture, say, say 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, food production. And there's a climatic change, which creates the possibility for doing that in a way that prior environments weren't very well suited to agriculture. So, I mean, this is kind of the standard story, is that uh, climatic changes led to the possibility of agriculture. Humans eventually invent agriculture, which allows them to have large populations. Now they need institutions and all kinds of other stuff to manage that, those large populations. Otherwise they break down into small populations and um, whatnot. So there, there's a lot of cultural evolution that needs to happen, but the basic possibility is a change in the environment and the invention of agriculture. All right. Well, I think that's all we've got time for. Dr. Henrik, thank you so much. It's been such a privilege to speak with you. I've really learned so much from your work, and it's completely altered the way I view our species. I hope you keep it up. All right. Thanks a lot. It was great chatting with you. That's our show. Thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you to Dr. Henrik again for coming on the show. If this topic interests you, I've linked Henrik's book, The Secret of Our Success, in the show description. At this point, I really view it as mandatory reading for anyone with the goal of understanding human evolution. It's a wonderful read, and I got so much out of it. Uh, Henrik couldn't give us more than an hour today. I'm sure many of you could hear me holding back follow-up questions, so 
that I could get through the topics that I wanted to touch, but really, Henrik is the sort of guest who, if I could keep him for three hours, I would. And so it's probably for the best that he had limited time, um, because I would have taken basically as much as he could give me. As a participant, that was a very enjoyable conversation. I can only hope the experience is the same for a listener. It's good to be back this week. As you've all noticed by now, we're going at a slower pace this summer, but it's wonderful to talk to you as always, wonderful to create content. And this form of interview, where I give an extended preamble first, getting you up to speed on the topic of the show, and then really zero in on the more academic side of things, is a kind of style of interview I want to do more this year, as it will allow me to cover topics that are let's say, closer to rocket science than basic biology. I'll talk to you again soon. Until then, have a great week, and remember to be kind to animals.